Uh, the contractor worker, when he went down into the space, uh, was wearing a uh, inline respirator, which was powered off of a compressor, or which was electric power off of a compressor. Uh, he did not have a five-minute escape bottle or any type of escape means. Uh, when he went down into the space, uh, the power to the compressor had been lost. Uh, at that time, he uh, panicked when he didn't have any air. He pulled the uh, mask off of his face. Uh, he took two or three breaths of pure gasoline fumes, and he went out. Once the uh, power had been cut off to the air compressor, the air compressor obviously stopped on the deck, and the the co-workers of the what's now a victim inside the hall realized there was a, a serious problem and that their, uh, their buddy didn't have any air. Their first thought was to go to the hole and jump down in the hole and run after him and get him, which is a common mistake. And uh, The one worker actually went to the hole, dug his head in, and then started to jump down in the hole um, in, in a futile attempt at making a, a, a rescue, and he almost became another victim. When the local fire department got on scene, uh, two firefighters tried to make entry using self-contained breathing apparatus. These self-contained breathing apparatus had to be removed from the firefighters' back in order to gain entry into the space. They were pushing the breathing apparatus in front of them. I suppose sometime after uh, 10 or 15 minutes of crawling and still following the civilian's airline and still not finding the victim, at some point the first firefighter started running low on air. But we believe at this point he started to go through one last uh, horizontal opening and as he did he pushed his breathing apparatus through the opening. When he pushed his breathing apparatus through the opening, it fell into the opening and pulled his mask off of his head and also pulled his head forward on the bash on his forehead. And he got about one or two gulps of the intensified gasoline vapors and then he became almost instantly paralyzed and was unable to move. Gone back and come back by that time and air was escaping from the SCBA into the atmosphere in his face and the bell was going off. Well, this firefighter tried to put his mask over top of the first firefighter to get him to take a few breaths quickly to find out that it wasn't going to help. He tried to put his mask back on and get back out real quick and by the time he got back to the opening, he had been overcome because he removed his mask also and a couple of fellow firefighters outside of the opening saw him and drug him out of his face. Our uh, technical rescue team was called on to to handle the call at this point because it was uh, obviously outside of the range of, uh, of normal structural equipment and training. So our first team in was going to look around, see what they could find, and we're assuming that maybe we're still doing a live rescue when the first firefighter in the hole. They uh, entered the hole, the first team entered the hole using supplied air breathing apparatus with uh, emergency escape bottles. If, if there was some problem with their airlines and they needed it, they would have it. They entered and followed the original civilian uh, contract workers airline and then they located the first firefighter in the hole. When we entered the space, to gain access to the first firefighter. As we did our search, we came upon him further down inside of the tank, and we put on a supplied air respirator on him, and then we commenced to check to see if he had a pulse and see if he was breathing. At that time, we determined that he was pulseless and breathless, and we decided to go ahead and pull out of the space and drop back into the recovery mode. More than 1.6 million workers enter spaces like storage tanks, process vessels, pits, vats, boilers, sewers, and pipelines. They go in these spaces to clean, repair, inspect, and maintain them. And every year, as many as 63 workers die in confined spaces. They are asphyxiated, burned, electrocuted, drowned, crushed, and ground up in machinery. Even more alarming is the fact that up to 60% of those who die are would-be rescuers. 
In some cases, as many as four people have died while trying to rescue a single victim. Who are these would-be rescuers? Without question, they're brave and compassionate. But sadly, many are also unintentional suicides. Not only do they fail to rescue the victim, but too often they end up becoming victims themselves. This program will show you how a well-planned rescue program can make your workplace safer for permit space workers and rescuers. A confined space is any area large enough and so configured that an employee can bodily enter and perform assigned work. It has limited means for entry and exit and is not designed for continuous occupancy. Because of their size, shape, or the potential for serious hazards, some confined spaces pose special dangers to workers who enter them. These are permit-required spaces. Certain safety procedures must be followed if you or co-workers must enter spaces which have one or more of these characteristics. One contains or has a potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. Two, contains a material that has the potential for engulfing an entrance. Three, has an internal configuration such that an entrance could be trapped or asphyxiated by inwardly converging walls or by a floor which slopes downward and tapers to a smaller cross-section. Four, contains any other recognized serious safety or health hazard. When workers must enter permit-required spaces, your employer may use a variety of methods to protect you from permit space hazards. These may include isolation, lockout procedures, safety lines, authorized attendance, atmospheric testing, and ventilation. Before you or any other worker can enter a permit-required confined space, you must have a written permit and you must be trained to recognize potential hazards to use safe practices, personal protective equipment, and self-rescue techniques. Before entering any confined space, workers should also make sure any on-site rescue equipment is in place. This may include a retrieval line attached to a body harness, as well as hoisting equipment if vertical exit may be required. The entry permit names the rescue service to be called, whether it's an in-plant team or off-site. Devices for summoning the rescue team, such as whistles, phones, or radios, must also be available. The safest rescue is the one that is never needed, so the written permit program is designed to keep you safe in permit-required spaces. Should an incident become an accident and self-rescue is impossible, it's time to call in the rescue team. employer can contact off-site rescue services or organize an on-site team. Depending on the type of permit required space work done at your facility, the location of your company and your company's capabilities in terms of personnel, training, and equipment. If your employer arranges to work with an off-site rescue team, such as the local fire department, this team will respond to any request for rescue services. The off-site team should be familiar with the specific confined space hazards in your workplace and prepared to deal with them in a timely manner. Or your employer may choose to organize an in-plant rescue team instead. This group of two or more employees is designated and trained to perform rescues in confined spaces in their plant. There should be an adequate number of team members available on each shift. 24 hours a day to respond quickly to any emergency that may take place at their facility. An in-plant team may be able to respond faster than most off-site teams, an important consideration when you may have just a few minutes to get a collapsed worker breathing again. An on-site team also may be more familiar with the specific hazards in your workplace, and they may know and work well with co-workers who are involved in the rescue. Almost anyone who is physically fit and has good endurance can try out for their company's in-plant rescue team. A line worker, supervisor, manager, male or female. Other important qualifications are enthusiasm and the willingness to learn. Above all, 
You must be a team player. Okay, so you made the rescue team. Before you start jumping into confined spaces and pulling people out, you can expect intensive and ongoing training. Your initial training will include how to perform rescue techniques geared to the confined spaces in your workplace, how to use any personal protective equipment, including respirators, you would need during these rescues, how to recognize confined space hazards, how to communicate in a confined space, how and when to perform self-rescue procedures in a confined space. Team members will maintain current certification in basic first aid and cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, skills. The team behind us, as you can see, is practicing utilizing a cage ladder weight to simulate a vessel. They have a victim in the bottom of the vessel. You see that we have easy access to both the victim, the simulated victim, and the systems in the event of a problem. We provide at least one instructor for every six students that we have in the class, which also helps attain a certain safety margin. At the present time, the team is simulating using the ladder cage as a staff, much like you would find it in a vessel in industrial complexes. They're bringing a victim from the base of the staff to the top level, which will simulate the top of the vessel. This is a perfect example of the safety afforded by using cage ladder waves. As you can see behind us, the victim just became hung up on a ladder rung, which now allows an additional rescue to climb up the ladder cage, access the problem, and correct it. It's also important to note that the victim that we use in this exercise is actually a rescue team member. We feel like this is important for the rescue team so that they can sympathize better with the victim and how the victim feels. Once he reaches the top, they'll be able to bring us to safety perhaps lower him down to an awaiting ambulance or stretcher. If all this training seems like a major undertaking, it is. But consider this. A well-trained team averages less than 30 minutes for a rescue, while untrained personnel can take hours to move a victim, time the victim may not have. cornerstones of any rescue training is learning to recognize confined space hazards and how to deal with them. Atmospheric hazards cause 90% of confined space fatalities. Atmospheres can be flammable, toxic, or oxygen deficient. They also can irritate the eyes and lungs, which can delay or impair escape from the space. Hazardous atmospheres can be created when workers use materials such as cleaning solvents inside or directly outside a confined space. Sanding, scraping, and loosening scale can stir up toxic or flammable substances. During training, you will learn how to recognize potentially hazardous atmospheres by using atmospheric testing and monitoring equipment. Other hazards are caused by the limited area of a confined space, including the danger of being engulfed in liquids or finely divided solids, caught in moving machinery, electrocuted, injured by a fall, or overcome by heat exhaustion. In addition, workers and rescuers have become wedged in a narrow portion of a space, like a chute, and suffocated because they couldn't move their chests enough to breathe. And, of course, the difficulty of getting into and out of a confined space can make rescue even tougher. Once you're aware of the particular hazards involved in the permit required spaces in your workplace, you can select appropriate personal protective equipment, from gloves and helmets to fully encapsulated suits. To avoid liability problems, make sure all rescue equipment is NFPA approved. The safest respirators for most permit space entries are self-contained breathing apparatuses, also known as SCBAs, or supplied air respirators known as SARs. Both devices supply clean air from an independent source. Powered air purifying respirators, PARs, or air purifying respirators, APRs, merely filter the surrounding air, 
which will not help you much if that air does not contain enough oxygen. Both SCBAs and SARs have pros and cons when used in confined spaces. With an SCBA, you carry your air supply in a cylinder on your back. Trouble is, some SCBA cylinders are too bulky to use in confined spaces, and your time in the confined space is restricted to the 30 to 60 minute air supply. Also keep in mind that with most SCBAs, the more strenuously you exert yourself, the faster you will use up the air. To make sure you allow enough time to get out of the space, a team member should keep track of your entry time, the amount of air you had at entry, and the time of victim contact. You may have a situation arise where a worker in trouble may need immediate rescue or attention, and the only air source available is an SCBA unit. In this case, it is recommended that the rescue team use an SCBA for limited entry with an escape pack for the worker. Once the worker is stabilized and receiving oxygen from the SCBA escape pack, a second team member wearing a supplied air respirator would bring a second SAR system for the worker and take over with definitive care. At that point, an unlimited supply of air would be available for the rescuer and individual in trouble. With an SAR, clean air is delivered to you through an airline hose from a source outside the confined space. You have no bulky cylinder and a virtually unlimited air supply unless it is cut off due to a problem with the airline hose or at the supply source. For maximum protection, rescue experts recommend using an SAR along with a small SCBA that contains enough air for an emergency exit. Whatever device you use, contaminants are less likely to leak into a positive pressure respirator with a full face piece. Here are some more tips. Check the respirator for proper fit each time you wear it. Exhale forcibly through the exhalation valve in the face piece to prevent carbon dioxide buildup in the mask, which will cause you to breathe faster. When repelling with an SCBA, all harness straps should be fastened and snug with helmet in place over face piece. Establish hand signals before entry especially when using respiratory protection. In part two of Confined Space Rescue, we will take a closer look at technical rescue. Time was Confined Space Rescue meant doing your best with a piece of rope and some strong backs. But unfortunately, doing your best was not always good enough. And forget about using motorized machines like cranes or mechanical winches. They're great for moving heavy loads, unless your cargo is human. Powered equipment must never be used for rescue because it can move too far too fast. If the victim gets entangled in the machinery or any other obstacle, the result may be crippling injury or death. But thanks to today's technical rescue techniques, you can retrieve trapped workers without further injury to the victim or unacceptable risk to the rescuers. Based on techniques developed for repelling, spelunking, and SWAT teams, technical rescue makes use of specially designed equipment and hauling systems based on mechanical theory. Although technical rescue techniques are easy to learn and use, they must be practiced thoroughly to be used quickly and reliably in an emergency. Never attempt to use any of the rescue techniques shown here without first receiving hands-on training. In technical rescue, systems of ropes and pulleys let you use mechanical advantage to make it easier to haul people. Mechanical advantage is the ratio of the amount of effort required to move a load in relation to the weight of the load. In hauling systems, traveling pulleys create mechanical advantage. Anchored pulleys merely change the direction of the pull. To calculate simple mechanical advantage, just add up the total number of lines attached to or leaving the load. 
With simple mechanical advantage, the higher the mechanical advantage, the more rope the system takes, and sometimes that can be a problem. Let's look at a few rescue systems and how they are used. The safest type of rescue is done externally without sending a rescuer into the confined space. Non-entry rescue is possible when the worker enters the confined space wearing a retrieval line attached to a body harness at one end and a mechanical winch on the other. If the worker passes out in the confined space, he can be cranked right back out. Crank operators must be careful to stop the instant they sense any extra pressure on the line that indicates the victim may have become entangled in a ladder or other obstacle. Cranking an entangled victim can quickly cause injury. Yet in most cases, internal rescue is necessary because the confined space contains obstacles that prevent the team from lifting the victim straight up and out of the space. With this simple four-to-one vertical system, the rescuer can be lowered into a shaft. Then it takes just two simple adjustments to convert to a system that can haul the rescuer and victim back out of the space. This complex four-to-one piggyback system is created by stacking one simple mechanical advantage system on top of another. It uses two different colored ropes and requires 75% less rope than a simple four-to-one system. This system may be pre-assembled and placed in a bag for rapid deployment. Of all the horizontal mechanical advantage systems, the piggyback is the one most easily converted to a lowering system, to a hauling system, and back. It is designed to be attached to any line that has been used for lowering or repelling. So if a rescuer is being lowered on a line and needs to be brought back up in a hurry, the piggyback system can be converted to a hauling system using the existing main line in a matter of seconds. This hauling system, aptly named the inchworm, is designed to enable a single rescuer to drag the victim horizontally along the inside of a pipe. The rescuer can also inch his way around obstacles by using this short four-to-one system, which is attached to a fixed line. Once you reach the victim, you must try to put him at ease while assessing his physical condition. Be alert for signs of panic or shock. If a victim is unconscious, you must try to keep his head stable and airway open. Placing a seat collar around his neck will provide some assistance in his breathing. Wristlets are sometimes used to fasten an unconscious victim's arms above his head. This helps keep his body in a straight line during egress. When a victim is injured, a lightweight plastic sked stretcher may be used to pull him to safety. Moving or caring for any injured victim can be a complex matter. It makes sense to receive specialized first aid training before you attempt it. Now for a word about rope. You can't give too much attention to this important tool. After all, your life and the lives of others will hang on it literally. There are two kinds of rescue rope. Static or low stretch kern mantle is a nylon sheathed rope used in rescue for control or as a retrieval line. Dynamic rope is used when long falls are expected because its elasticity helps break the fall. Always use new rope in an actual rescue and then destroy it. Used rope may have been subjected to adverse conditions making it unsafe to use for humans. Training rope can be reused but safety lines should always be used in case the primary line fails. Rescue rope must be carefully protected. It can be damaged by exposure to direct sunlight, acid, dirt, and grit, and high temperatures. Do not walk or stand on rope or smoke near it. Inspect rope carefully after use by feeling and looking for damage as you run it through your bare hands. When in doubt, Cut it off and throw it out. As important as the rope you use is what you do with it. For example, tying knots can make it less efficient. 
So choose knots which avoid acute bends. It is also important to provide additional safety to rescue knots by tying an overhand knot with any loose end. This will prevent the main knot from slipping. Once you're familiar with rescue rope and knot tying, you need to know how to select anchor points for a rigging system. Steel beams are the strongest anchors. Other good anchors can include concrete structural columns, window washer eye bolts, and large machinery supports. Guy wire hooks, insulated pipe, and flimsy handrails should never be used. Remember, your system is only as strong as your weakest link. That's why you should keep anchoring system links to a minimum. Several poor anchors do not add up to one strong anchor. If an anchor is questionable, use a secondary backup anchor as strong or stronger than the primary anchor. Be sure to pad all abrasion points or sharp edges and inspect frequently. Avoid hard links such as carabiners to carabiners. Also avoid nylon on nylon. It comes down to this. Rescuers can't be too careful. Here are some more tips to keep you on your toes. Always use safety lines and backup hardware. Double check all rigging by sight and touch. Know your equipment, its proper name, strengths, and weaknesses. Control equipment. Do not lay it down. Clip it to your harness. Maintain equipment properly. Inspect constantly for wear and damage. Clean as recommended by the manufacturer. Pay attention. Complacency kills. Physical training alone isn't enough for a rescuer. You also need to be prepared psychologically. Because at any moment during a confined space rescue, you may find yourself face to face with an unexpected companion. Fear. It may sneak up as you're inching along some dark, slimy space. It may come when you try to fully expand your chest to breathe, but you can't because your environment is pressing in on you. Let's be honest. Confined space rescue is one of the most unpleasant and risky things you'll ever do in your life. Yet fear doesn't have to be paralyzing. You can learn to work through it according to Captain Michael G. Brown, technical coordinator for Virginia's heavy and tactical rescue team, if you follow these five tips. Number one, don't fight feelings of fear or anxiety in a confined space. It's normal and reasonable to feel fear in a confined space emergency. Expect it. Two, when the fear arrives, wait and let it be. Three, focus on the rescue goal before you, one step at a time. For example, tell yourself, now I must stabilize the victim or now I must move him to safety. Four, monitor your fear level from time to time and measure it on a scale from one to 10. This helps make you more objective so that you can master your fear. And don't be surprised if feelings of fear go away, only to return again. And finally, learn to appreciate functioning with a level of fear. Controlled fear helps to keep you alert and keep you on your toes. Once a rescue is completed, you may find it helpful to talk over your feelings with your fellow rescuers. This is especially important in those cases when rescue just is not possible. Because no matter how much you train or how sophisticated your rescue equipment is, Sometimes you just can't get a co-worker out in time. At times, you may even have to use your skills to retrieve a body. Although this provides an important service for the victim's family, it can be hard to deal with when your mission is to save lives. Finally, one of the goals of training is learning to work as a team. Everyone on the rescue team must play a specific role, whether as part of the haul team, as the rescuer who assesses the victim, or as the haul captain who watches the overall operation and gives command. Although the roles will change with each rescue, it is important to learn to work toward your goal as one smooth unit. And in a larger sense, the same is true for everyone in your company. 
From the worker who diligently follows confined space safety procedures to the supervisor who supports the activities of the rescue team during training and actual rescues. To the person who calls in the rescue team in an emergency instead of entering the confined space himself. Confined space rescue requires a big investment from you and your employer. But the rewards are worth it.